Just so you morons know the way comedy <laughs> works is when you go into city, if you eat dicks, if you eat all the dicks, so not when you go it. back, they do not buy tickets. Yeah. It's not, even if they're like, oh, I like Steve, I like him on jacket, it doesn't matter. They're right. not buying your ticket. Right. So for you to come back to a market, if you're selling more and more tickets, it means you're doing something right. It means you're funny. Yeah. So for me, I always gauge my level of stand up and how I'm doing depend when I go back to markets, if I'm selling more and more tickets. <laughs> <laughs> Look at that screenshot. Good afternoon. Unfortunately, something came up in the schedule, so he had to cancel his shows. However, we are working to find a new date. Sorry for the inconvenience. Brendan's been cancelling shows at a record pace lately. Record pace of cancelling shows. Record pace. It's absolutely incredible how often he's been cancelling shows. Left, right, and sometimes in like comedy clubs with like 50 tables, if that. He's cancelling fucking clutch. Like, imagine cancelling shows with 50 tables. Can you imagine? Can you fucking imagine? And I love how the things he says always sound like something Rogan said. But if you're Rogan, they make more sense. They sound better coming from Rogan. Even though he's not the funniest, they just sound better coming from him. But he's such a parrot. He's such a fucking Joe Rogan Avenger, right? He's always got his fucking cock in his mouth. He probably loves Rogan more than his own dad. That he just copies and parrots everything that man says and tries to apply it to his career and say, oh yeah, you know, every time I sell tickets, I judge my success in the market based on the tickets I sell. Bitch, you're not that funny. How can you judge that? You're always going to have peaks and valleys. You're not, you're not growing exponentially. If anything, you're going the opposite way. And also, I love how there's never a mention of just being funny. It's always about selling tickets. There's never a mention of, oh, I judge how funny. I That's why it was so refreshing to hear Kevin Hart, no, um, Cat Williams, sorry, on that interview with Shannon Sharp talk about how he used to sit down and watch different comedians in the back and just talk about, you know, and note down how many laughs they got and compare them to his and use it maybe as a barometer or something to aim at, right? Something to aim for, sorry. It was refreshing to hear somebody talk about that because if you listen to JRV verse, BAPA verse comedians, or just the LA types in general, you'd think the only thing about stand up comedy that matters is like selling tickets, selling out a tour, getting booked. That's the only important thing. But at least with Cat Williams, you heard him talk about comedy. You heard how passionately he spoke about jokes. He was upset that somebody stole his joke, he was upset that somebody stole his friend's joke. The sanctity of that, the respect of that, the artistry of that, like actually taking it seriously, not about selling out. Nah, but of course, this guy, all he cares about is selling out tickets. And that's how he judges his success. No wonder he's a failure. Oh, I sold more tickets now, so I must be doing good. No, motherfucker. Can't you judge it based on how many laughs you're getting? Last time you came to this location, you got this amount of laughs. Last time, this time you came... You know I mean, like, because sometimes I, I'd imagine if you're a comedian, maybe you might go back to a market that you did really well at before or you did really bad at. You come back, you come back another time, you sell less tickets, but the people that are there are laughing way more than the previous time you were there. Isn't that an improvement? Are you going to count that as a loss? Because you sold 30 tickets last time, but no one laughed. But this time you sell five and everybody's laughing. Wouldn't that be, in, wouldn't that be something to kind of like, you know, take some sort of like credit for or be like glad about and use that maybe as a you know as maybe something to kind of work on and work up to or whatever it may be watching this clip again and knowing what we know about steve-o being a bit of a homeless cat and obviously the video clip of him and tony hinchcliffe that went viral of death by a thousand cuts that you mean the arlington where gringo poppy was filmed Wait, is that where is that where <laughs> that was filmed? Is it the, the the Dallas Improv Arlington? I think so. Yeah, that's where Gringo Poppy was filmed. Oh, no, Dude, tough act to follow. <laughs> <laughs> Pressure's on. <laughs> Oh man, how do you know that? How do you know that was filmed there? Um, I was fascinated by the entire <laughs> I even know where the construction paper came from. <laughs> oh my god. I even know who cut it out. <laughs> 
Oh my god, it's so funny. Yeah, <laughs> we all are. We're all very fascinated about it. It was fascinating. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, just like I'm particularly close to that because of the known for other things coming into stand up. Like um, first special on Showtime, you know, yeah. and then like uh, putting out the second special on, on you know, on, yeah. your own. on your own. Thirty-five minutes. Twenty-five. It was it really? It was Twenty-five. Oh. My goodness. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it's yeah. interesting. It's like, uh, it's like death by a thousand self-inflicted paper cuts or something it's, like yeah, that. It, it, it's pretty intense. Am I the only one, again, it's a very short clip. Am I the only one that can sense a bit of tension between them? Maybe I'll go, maybe I'll do another live stream where I rewatch this interview again with Brendan and Steve-O. I think he was a lot more contentious than we remember. I think Brendan was aware that Steve doesn't really like him. I think he kind of sensed it because this, it kind of, you know, there's a lot of like tension in that room or in that caravan. Am I, am I reading it wrong? It's an old interview, but it feels like Brendan knew back then that Steve really wasn't good on him. Maybe it was because of Brendan, what he said to his friend, the co-host. Then he called the co-host a casual. He called him a casual or something about a casual MMA or UFC fan. But I feel like it was a bit tense. Just so you morons know the way comedy <laughs> works is when you go into city, if you eat dicks, if you eat all the dicks, when you go you back, that. they do not buy tickets. Yeah. It's not, even if they're like, oh, I like Steve, I like him on jacket, it doesn't matter. They're right. not buying your ticket. Right. So for you to come back to a market, if you're selling more and more tickets, it means you're doing something right. It means you're funny. Yeah. So for me, I always gauge my level of stand up and how I'm doing depend when I go back to markets, if I'm selling more and more tickets. <laughs> I understand what they mean, and the people are saying in the chat that Steve is not that funny, but I think that's the case I've been making. If you watch my fucking, um, what you call it, my Pete Davidson reaction on Patreon, you'll see. I basically make the point of saying that that's. I understand why Brendan doesn't give up on stand up. I get it. I get why he does stand up, because in my opinion, I don't think there's that much separating him from from Pete Davidson. Most comedians aren't that funny. So I think Steve-O, even though he's not that funny, he's still funnier than Brendan in his head. He's like, okay, I might not be funny, but I have to be funnier than this guy because he's fucking horrible. And I think that's why they, I think that's why the standards are so shit because they're all comparing each other. They're all comparing themselves to each other, but they're all kind of on the same level. <laughs> Do you get what I mean? They're all kind of on the same level. I swear to God, like Steve-O has probably done it 10 years Brendan, he's not that far off from Brendan. Like, I, I don't care what you guys like. They're all the same, bro. They're all, the good ones are the good ones, but most of them aren't that good. What do I know? What do I know? Maybe I'm confused. Maybe I'm an idiot. What do I know? Marty Moo says, Steve-O isn't funny. He works on his one-man show, Hard as Fuck. Um, Papa stand up inside baseball as bad as UFC picks. <laughs> exactly. Uh, <laughs> Ah, uh, big up MM. They're all funnier than Tripoli. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Amy Schumer's fucking funnier than Sam Tripoli. To be honest, let's be real. Fucking what? What's her name? Is it Nan Golden? Not Nan Gold. What's her name? Who's that? Who's that? Who's that big lesbian woman? She's funnier than fucking Tripoli. You know what I mean? They're all funnier than Tripoli. I, I'm not having listening to Tripoli screaming about conspiracy theories for thirty minutes. Like, no, thank you. I'm okay. I'll actually put. You know what? This is very, 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 very toxic. I would much rather see Tripoli high on coke or meth or whatever he does, ranting. That would be way funnier than him trying to tell jokes. If he's not crashing out on stage, I don't care. If he's not screaming about flat earth, lizard people, you know, um, what's that thing called? The pizza cafe or whatever, right? Jan 6, high on coke or something. I don't care. If he's just telling jokes, get fucked. Get fucked. Um, Martin Moose, Steve is a good storyteller, more than a storyteller. Um, they all suck. Some guy, Sam Tripoli, the unfunny act, Alex Jones, Lowell's, Jared Mellorick says Leslie. Yeah, Leslie something, whatever her fucking name is. Um, Jessica Kirsten, or however you spell it. Yeah, she's funny. I like her. Jessica Kirsten's really funny. She's good on podcasts too. Her last appearance on your mum's house was really good, actually. Um, anyway, moving on from that one. Moving on from that one. Um, so what do you think is going on with his shows here allegedly 
Brendan sold 10 tickets at this location. Big Love Comedy in Austin. 10 tickets. God damn. What they say here in the caption? The grey seats are the ones that are sold. So the grey seats are the sold ones. God almighty says this. 39, 37. Is that it? <laughs> oh, and some at 36. Fucking hell. Do you think... Do we agree with fucking Unique's opinion? Because Unique is the one that put out the theory that he thinks Brendan books these places himself. He calls them up somehow. Because I didn't know that was possible. I didn't know as a comedian, you could just book your own shows. You could just call up a comedy club and say, hey, I want to play somewhere. And then they can, I guess, you know, you know, I guess if you have the money and a deposit, you can just perform anywhere. Unique thinks that's what he's doing. He's just booking his own shows but he's not being invited to perform there. But still, you're still losing money, no? Because again, I think for me personally, having put on parties, again, maybe it's different in comedy, but having organized raves, even if you hire a venue, you still have to like pass a certain threshold of tickets sold or something to make it worthwhile for the venue because the venue themselves have to, you know, hire, have their staff come in, bartenders bar backs cloakroom people security so you have to make it worth their while so if there's not enough people coming through sometimes they'll, they'll cancel the event like i've had it happen to me like twice where i put on a party and then an hour into it the people i'll be like hey we just have to cancel it because it's going to cost us more running like having the lights on than you're going to ever make at the bar <laughs> <laughs> which is a really humbling thing to be fair when you put in a party and the, the, the promoter literally turns off the electricity <laughs> because it's going to cost more to fucking keep the lights on than i'm ever going to make at the door so i'm surprised with comedy you can book a venue and then you can still sell only what 10 tickets and have it still go on doesn't make any sense does it but comedy, comedy is so brutal. There was a time where Brendan was selling out places. There was a time when on the Fire and a Kid, at the end of the show, when they plugged their dates, Brendan would sometimes like talk mockingly or joke about, oh, let me promote my, let me promote my dates. And he'd be like, oh no, there's no point. It's all sold out anyway. But go on tfatk.com. Like he'd be so happy about that. And then you go to Brian and he'll be trying to shield his dates super hard because he didn't sell anything. Imagine going from that to this. The entertainment industry is very humbling. The entertainment industry is very, very humbling. Look at this, another one. Brendan Schaub's delisted free Edmonton dates from his site and the ticket sales have been paused. God almighty, bro. The amount of dates he cancels is so insane. On the regular basis, cancel, 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 cancel. Being a Bapa fan is a commitment because you never know when the next date is going to cancel. You never fucking know. But hey, I guess this is part of his karma, isn't it, maybe? Who knows? Who fucking knows? Who fucking knows?